question that I was going to poll you to find for this lecture, I didn't really put any notes except for the review of the past lecture to see a blank sheet on model because I'm going to write it out, uh, all the things that we're going to develop. So how many of you prefer the old method where I pre-populate the notes and then I just come and talk and scribble a few things so that you have a neat set of notes, I guess, uh, versus how many of you prefer that old type? Only a few. How many of you prefer this type where I write it out on the board in detail? It's kind of one, two, three, equally split and uh, not really passionately feeling for either one of them, I suppose. <laughs> I, I felt, I mean, as a student, if I were a student, I would have preferred method one because I don't have to take notes. I just pay attention. If I'm writing and if you are scrambling to write everything that is on the board, then I feel that you're not paying attention to what I'm saying. You are paying attention to what is on the board and you want to get it down. Now, this way you really don't have to because whatever I write, I will post it afterwards, after the lecture, a copy of it. And the last lecture is already, the scribbled one uh, is already on Mori. Okay? So you still don't have to take notes. I would rather have you pay attention to what we are saying and participate and ask questions and stuff like that would be more valuable from an educational point of view than uh, writing it down. Okay, I hope you have given some feedback on the questionnaire about the course, particularly the use of these kind of uh, techniques to enhance uh, your learning. Now, in the last lecture, we looked at boundary value problems okay, for a single nonlinear algebraic equation, and your next assignment is going to be based on that. Uh, what I have in mind is to solve that particular equation using BBP4C and using your own finite difference method with Newton method and using COMSOL, all three of them. Okay? Uh, and then we saw how to set up the Newton method, how to construct the Jacobian matrix, okay? and we implemented the same thing in COMSOL. Um, and the, the next problem that we saw was to extend the idea from a single uh, boundary value problem to a system of equations where you have two variables, u and b. Okay? The idea is the same. Every derivative is replaced by finite difference approximation to convert the differential equation into a set of algebraic equations. And then you solve the algebraic equations using a suitable method. If it is linear, you use a matrix inverse. If it is nonlinear, you use Newton method, which still requires a matrix inverse. So the entire numerical computational modeling relies on linear algebra and nonlinear equation solving and then builds everything else on top of that. So the last topic that I wanted to cover is initial value problems. So we classified the models as to uh, boundary value problems or initial value problems, ordinary differential equations. PDE, we won't have much time to explore in detail, but we will do one or two examples because the idea again is if I give you a partial differential equation, you are going to convert that into either an ordinary differential equation or an algebraic equation. Then use all the methods that we have uh, developed to solve them. So if you have a boundary value problem, you convert that to algebraic equations and use the methods that we have seen to solve them. So the same thing, we're bu building one on top of the other. So the initial value problems are those where you have, again, an ordinary set of ordinary differential equations. And equals f of y comma t. It could be of this form, okay? And it could be a vector. Now, if you have a higher order differential equation, you know how to convert that into a system of first order equations. So when I put an underscore there, that means it could be a vector. I could have many first order equations. Now, and then I need a set of initial conditions, and that is going to be y at t equal to zero is some vector, initial condition y zero, set of numbers. You know already how to solve this using ODE 45, ODE 15, S, etc. Now we are exploring what are the ideas involved in those algorithms, ODE 45, how does it do it? Okay. Now, we are, along the way, we are going to see a lot of concepts, so a lot of terminologies that capture some ideas, and uh, it's important for you to be able to understand what they mean. So, this set of equations is called non autonomous.
Woody 4515S, they all handle non-autonomous system. Now, what do we mean by non-autonomous system? It simply means that T appears explicitly as a function in the right-hand side of that equation. Time appears explicitly as a variable on the function. Okay? So if T appears explicitly, you call it non-autonomous system. Now, if you have an alternate variation where you have dy dt equals f of y alone, there is no t explicitly appearing in there. You don't have to write it down because I am going to post it uh, after the class. Okay, Those are called autonomous. system of equations. So here T does not appear explicitly. Okay? <coughs> the algorithms that we are going to develop are for autonomous system, but you can always make a non-autonomous system look like an autonomous system by simply adding an additional variable and an additional equation. Okay? So let's see that idea first. Any questions on this? This is just a definition. We are defining any problem in which T appears on the right hand side explicitly as a non-autonomous system and any problem where it does not appear as an autonomous system. Maybe let me give you an example okay, of each one. Example of a non-autonomous system. Okay, So I have dy1 dt equals uh, exponential of y1 uh, plus sine omega t and uh, multiplied by y2 okay and then dy2 dt equals exponential of y2 plus y1 times cos omega t Okay, so there are two. Th these are two equations in two unknowns. Y1 and Y2 are the unknowns. Okay, but what you will notice is on the right hand side, I not only have Y1 and Y2, <coughs> but I also have T explicitly appearing. These are problems that you will encounter in process control. For example, you have a process, a distillation column, and you write down the set of equations, and they initially look like an autonomous system because the variables could be temperatures and concentrations in the column and you get a set of equations that relate the temperature and concentration and then you're going to come and impose a control action you're going to say with time I'm going to change the heating rate for example okay then you will have terms like this that appear explicitly with time in them so typically in control related problems you will have non-autonomous type of equations where T appears explicitly now, is that a linear or nonlinear problem? Nonlinear. Non Why? Because I have exponential. exponential. Is it a coupled or an uncoupled problem? Coupled. Coupled. Because y1 affects y2 and y2 affects y1. It's coupled both ways. Okay? So, an example of, of an autonomous system would be dy1 dt equals 10 y1 plus 25 y2 dy2 dt will be 7 y1 plus 5 y2 so here the f1 and f2 are fairly simple looking functions and they do, do not have time in them okay so that will be an autonomous system is that linear or non-linear that's a linear system. Okay? So you should be able to write this equation in the form dy dt equals a y. What do you think a, the matrix A will look like in that case? Two by two matrix with the elements as 10, 25, 7 and 5. That's all it is. Okay. But the algorithms that we are going to see can handle autonomous or non-autonomous as well as uh, <coughs> linear or non-linear. Okay. Any questions on those? <coughs> now, I said that I can always convert a non-autonomous system into an autonomous system. How do I do that? Okay. So I do that by the following procedure. 
okay convert non autonomous to an autonomous system this is one thing I don't like in writing the notes there are two things one is my handwriting is terrible the other thing is it slows me down because I'm writing everything if I had typed this before I could go on and cover more material um, that, that's one viewpoint okay so if I have dy dt equals f of y comma t that's a non-autonomous system how do I convert that into an autonomous system so I'm going to define a new variable let me call it capital Y which is going to consist of small y and t capital Y is a vector that is consisting of all the original vectors in y and I'm going to make t as a new variable okay so my new vector y contains lowercase y and t and then I'm going to define because I have introduced a new variable uh, which is y n plus 1 so this is the same as if you want to expand y1 to y n and y n plus 1 with y n plus 1 being equal to this and y1 to y n being contained in this vector okay so I've expanded the variable so I need I can add one more equation because I have an extra variable and that equation is going to be maybe you can help me with dyn plus 1 dt equals what exactly it's very simple it's just one because I've defined yn plus 1 as t so if I take its derivative dyn plus 1 dt is equal to 1 so my n plus 1 th function is simply one okay so I expand my function set also as consisting of f and 1 okay where f n plus 1 is equal to 1 so my new equations will look like d capital Y dt equals capital F which is a function only of capital Y so t does not appear so it's a simple trick that shows that you can easily convert a non-autonomous system into an autonomous system so we need to develop algorithms only for autonomous equations you can easily always make this transformation internally okay any question on that idea okay you expand the variable by set by one and add one additional equation and all that equation does is keeps track of time for you okay so y n plus one is the same as t and you can integrate that to find out what t is and wherever you have t in your original equation if you have t in your original equation you replace it by y n plus one that's all you need to do okay any questions on that okay and you also know and you should these are all from chapter five of the textbook you should also know how to convert a higher order system to a system of first order equations we have done that for both boundary value problems and initial value problems now boundary value problems if we use BVP4C you need to do that trick if you're using finite difference you don't need to do that if I give you a second order you can just work with the second order equation okay uh, but for initial value problems all the algorithms rely on this fact that you can always convert a higher order system into a system of first order equations okay so I'm not going to review that because we have already seen that so I'm going to start developing the methods okay what are the methods so conceptually let's just figure out what it is that we want to do if this is time if this is y and that is y0 my initial condition I want to construct a curve that is a solution to the differential equation okay and I cannot construct the continuous curve continuous curve would mean analytical solution I cannot do that because the problem is nonlinear perhaps okay so I'm going to rely on constructing a discrete set of values approximating that curve and I need to learn what are the <coughs> sources of error introduced in that approximation how do I control that error and how do I implement it numerically so we will write a small algorithm that is equivalent to ODE 4.5 for example in its function okay so the ideas for the algorithm the first one is called the Euler scheme Euler method named after Leonard Euler I believe okay so the idea we already talked about the, towards the end of the last class the basic idea is if you give me what the initial condition is 
I plug that initial condition. Remember, this equation is dy dt equals f of y. Let me just deal with scalar equations, a single equation and a single unknown first. The idea easily extends it to a vector form. Okay? So a single equation dy dt equals f of y. It is an autonomous system. And I know that y at t equal to 0 is y0. That is my initial condition. So if I take that initial condition and plug it in there, I can calculate f because f is a known function. But f is the slope. So I can use the slope to predict what the next value will be by drawing the tangent to that curve. Okay? So Taylor series. Once again, Taylor series comes to our rescue in developing these ideas at the same time allowing us to estimate what the error is in the approximation. Okay? So we're going to use Taylor series method to develop the Euler uh, scheme. Okay? What are we going to do? We are going to develop the Taylor series for this function y at tn plus h. I'm going to use the symbol n to indicate, uh, maybe I should use i to indicate the time, ti plus h. So I have a discrete time domain starting from t0, t1, t2, etc. some typical value ti. So if I am at some typical position i, the value of that function from that point in the neighborhood of that point, ti. Okay, h is the step size, is the distance between these two points. So from Taylor series, do you, you know what this is? It is given by y at ti plus dy dt at i multiplied by h plus d square y dt square at i multiplied by h square over 2, etc. It's an infinite series, which allows us to calculate what is the value of the function y in the neighborhood of ti, my reference point. Okay? But I know what is dy dt. dy dt is that, that is the same as f. And I can truncate the series at this point. Okay, <clears throat> so I will have a truncation error of order h square. So it's a very simple idea. Okay, so if I make those changes, then I, what I will get is y. I will represent this as y i plus one, meaning it is the next value t i plus h is the same as evaluated at y i plus one is equal to y i plus d y d t is replaced by f and there is h there h times f at evaluated at i with a truncation error of order h square. Okay. So that is called Euler scheme, explicit Euler scheme. Okay. So this is called the local truncation error. Why do you think it's called the local truncation error? It is the valid at that point. It is valid in going from step i to step i plus 1. This is the error incurred in one marching step. But you will have that error in every marching step. So the global error is going to be larger than this. And it will be of order h, exactly. Okay? So the local error is of order h squared. The global error is of order h, because you're just summing up all the errors. Okay? And it's called an explicit method. Why is it called an explicit method? Because you can predict the next value y n plus 1 by knowing what the current value is. That's all you need to know. If you know y i, you can evaluate that and you can also evaluate the function. Because the function is known, you plug in y i into that function. So you can evaluate that and you choose the step size. You choose the step size to control the error. Okay? So all the three terms on the right hand side are known. The truncation error is just an indicator for us to tell us what is the order of the error. Okay? So if you pick a step size of 0 0.01, the error is going to be of 0 0.0001, about three significant digits okay? in going from one step to the next step. This is the one that we need to implement to write a MATLAB program that is equivalent to ODE 4.5. Okay? That will allow us to apply repeatedly going from i equal to 0, 1, 2, etc. 
all the way to infinity. Of course, we're not going to do it all the way to infinity. We're going to see how long you specify. Remember, in OD45, you specify T span. T span is from the current position to the some marching and end position. Okay. Any questions on that idea? All the basic ideas of initial value problem algorithms are embedded in the simple method. Everything else is to improve the accuracy, embellishments of ideas on that. But the core of the idea is extremely simple. Knowing the current step, project the next step in an approximate fashion using the Taylor series expansion. And the projection is made possible because this f is the slope. That is a function that is known, but it is also the slope. So you can take the slope and multiply it by h. Any questions? We will come back and write a MATLAB program to implement this particular idea. But let's explore a lot of other ideas before we come back to this. The question now would be, OK, I have a method. How does this method work? And can, can I do something better than this method if I want to get more accurate algorithm? So that the re why would you want to get a more accurate algorithm? If you are confined to only using this algorithm, the only way you have controlling the error is controlling the step size. So you need to take smaller and smaller step size for more difficult and difficult problems. Okay? Whereas if you can develop other methods, maybe you can get larger step size and still control the error accurately. Yeah. Why do you truncate it after the uh, linear term? Very good question. Why do you truncate it after the linear term? What would happen if you want to decide to take the next term and truncate it after, after this place? Then you need to calculate this. In the Taylor series, you need to calculate the d squared y dt squared. The question is, can I do that? And the answer is, yes, you can do that. And in fact, the Rangakata class of methods that ODE45 uses, in fact, does exactly that kind of idea. Okay? But in this particular idea of expanding this, we, we will get into trouble. Why? Because we need to take the derivative. Remember, d squared y dt squared is the same as d dt of dy dt, which is the same as f. So you need to take that function. You know the function. You need to take the function and take its derivative. So for every problem, you need to evaluate that explicitly. So okay. It's, like it's 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 more than Jacobian because yeah, it is like taking the derivative for every specific problem. So we want to develop an algorithm that is independent of the problem, so that we can use only the functions. I'm ready to evaluate the function at many positions, not just one position, to improve the accuracy. And why can't you use finite uh, differentiation? You can. We will see that method later on. We will use the polynomial approximation, numerical derivative, numerical integration ideas to develop a whole class of methods. Those are called multi-step methods. Okay, so there are th this topic itself, there are whole books devoted to ordinary differential equations, initial value problems alone, algorithms that are developed. But all these ideas have been encoded into that particular algorithm, ODE45 and ODE15S. These are two important algorithms that encode all the ideas that we are going to talk about. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So one idea that you already gave, how can I improve the accuracy is keep the second term, right? Um, but that term leads us to difficulty because having to take the derivative of the function with respect to t. And it gets more complicated as you go for higher and higher order terms. Okay? So can we use the Newton polynomials to see whether we can expand the accuracy? So we're going to do that by first applying the Newton's polynomial to rederive this explicit method to make sure that we get the same formula by Newton polynomial and then expand from there. Okay? So use of Newton polynomials. <coughs> what is the Newton polynomial? Do you remember? f of y is approximated by a polynomial of degree m, for example, with tn plus alpha h. Okay. Now t is the independent variable. Before we were using x, now t is the independent variable. So tn uh, or I should say Ti. Let me just be consistent. Ti is some current location where I know the value and I'm trying to calculate the ones at the next step. So alpha is the variable. Okay, so the relationship between T and alpha would be T equals Ti 
plus alpha h. h is the step size. Ti is the reference point I pick, the current point, h is the step size, and alpha is a new variable that relates to time. Okay? So this polynomial is going to be, uh, the forward one is going to be something like this, 1 plus alpha <coughs> delta plus alpha times alpha minus 1 delta square over 2. It will just go on, and let me write the mth term in that, alpha times alpha minus 1 times alpha minus uh, m plus 1 divided by m factorial delta m operating on f. I'm truncating the series there. So the error in the next term is going to be of order h m plus 1. Exactly. Very good. Okay. So I have the problem of dy dt equals f, but I'm going to represent f by this polynomial approximation because it gives me an automatic systematic way of increasing the accuracy by taking more terms in the series. Taylor series fails if I do that. Okay? Here all I need to do is evaluate the functions itself, not its derivatives. Okay, so now I am going to write this equation dy dt equals f of y and I am going to separate and integrate that. So I am going to write this as dy is equal to f dt. So I'm taking dt to the right hand side and I'm integrating from yi to yi plus 1 and from ti to ti plus 1. Okay, numerically, approximately. So where is the approximation? The approximation is in replacing this function with that polynomial in the integral. So I've converted the problem of integrating initial value problems to one of evaluating quadratures. That is just an integral. You need to evaluate the integral on the right hand side. On the left hand side, integral of dy would be what? Simply y evaluated between the two limits. This will be yi plus 1 minus yi. That is the left hand side term because it is integral of dy, which is simply y, and then apply the limits between the top and the bottom. On the right hand side, I need to replace the function by the polynomial. Okay? So, and I need to replace dt by d alpha. Okay? Because t is equal to ti plus alpha. So dt from this formula from this formula, dt is going to be equal to h times d alpha. Again, we have done this many times before in developing the uh, Simpson's method and trapezoidal rule, etc. Okay, so the function itself becomes one plus alpha delta plus alpha times alpha minus one over two factorial delta square, etc., etc., operating on f i, and then dt becomes h times d alpha. Okay? And what, is, what do the limit will become? From t i to t i plus 1. When t is t i, what is alpha? Zero. So it will become 0 to 1. Okay? So you need to evaluate that definite integral between 0 to 1 by truncating that series at various terms. And we will see that and uh, this also leads to some problems, and we will see what kind of problems that uh, we get into. Okay? Any questions now? So we have taken that initial value problem, replaced the function with the, quad with the pro polynomial approximation, and reduced it into this equation. So now let's take a one-term expansion. Okay? One-term expansion. That means m is what? Zero. So what will be the truncation error in this? Of order? H. Okay. And the left the equation will become yi plus 1. I'm going to move this yi to the right hand side. I'm going to write this as yi plus 1 equals yi plus integral 0 to 1. 1 operating on f, h d alpha, plus truncation error of order h, 
multiplied by I have an integral there too, right? H the alpha. Okay, that's why I get an error of order h squared. Okay, now what is integral of d alpha? Is equal to y i plus uh, h. H is a constant. F is also a constant. Okay, f i. Remember this is f i. So integral of alpha d alpha is alpha between the limits of zero and one. That's going to be simply one plus a term of order h squared. And that is exactly the same formula that we developed from Taylor series, the Euler method. If you know yi, and you can evaluate fi, and you take the step size, and you predict what yi plus 1 will be. Question? Uh, this is just something I haven't really understood. Whenever you multiply h times h underneath the interval to get the h squared, whatever you integrate it, why don't you get h cubed as an error instead of just? Because h is a constant. The integration is with respect to alpha. Okay, h is a constant. So that term order h simply says that there is a term that has only h in it. It doesn't have h square or h cube. It has only h in it. But we don't know exactly what the pre-multiplying factor is. Okay. And if you look at, that's a good question. If you look at uh, the Taylor series expansion, in fact, we can know what the multiplying factor that we don't know anything about. For example, in the first term, dy dt, we know it is f. Okay, but the next term, I have a term h square, but it has a term that has a second derivative. And I say, I'm not going to spend the time to evaluate what the second derivative is, so I just say there is some multiplying factor that multiplies h square. That's why we use the symbol, it is of order h square. Simply means there is an h square term multiplied by some constant. Okay, but the integration is not with respect to h, it is with respect to alpha. Okay. Any other questions? So, what this allows us to do is, well, we have verified the same Taylor series expansion formula that we have. We can also get from Newton polynomial. But we have now the ability to take the next term, okay, to see what would be, and again, this is the same method, explicit method, explicit because everything on the right hand side depends only on i, okay, not on i plus 1. So let's do a two term expansion now. The two term expansion is going to be basically the same thing with the two terms from the series. So it's going to be yi plus 1 equals yi plus integral 0 to 1. 1 plus alpha delta operating on fi h d alpha plus integral of, what would that term be? Neglected term. For the h squared multiplied by h d alpha. So the truncation error now is of order h squared multiplied by h. So of order h q. Okay? The local truncation error of this formula, if you are successful in developing it, would be of order h q. Okay? So this whole thing is of order h q. But we need to work on the integral. So let's figure it out. Okay, yi plus. Remember, in the integral, we are integrating only with respect to alpha. H is a constant, f is a constant. Okay? So it's going to be fi. Uh, <coughs> let me just write it out. fi d alpha plus integral of delta fi times alpha d alpha. Of course, everything gets multiplied by h. Plus this off order h cubed term. Okay. So I've just split it up into two parts. Okay. The first one is fi, fi with d alpha, and h is there. And the second term is alpha times h d alpha, so h d alpha is there, and then delta fi. Delta fi is a finite difference term. We know how to take the difference term by definition. Okay. Does anybody see any problem, anticipate any problem with this formula? Now I'm asking you to project, look ahead. Of course, it will become obvious once we try to develop this. Think about it. Okay? So this is going to be yi plus hfi. Limits are 0 to 1 for these. Okay? So integral of d alpha is once again alpha. Within the limits 0 to 1, it simply is 1. Plus h alpha times d alpha is what? 
alpha square over 2, right? Alpha square over 2 between the limits of 0 and 1. And what is delta fi? Do you remember? If we had the quiz today, you would have studied for it. Delta fi would be fi plus 1 minus fi. That's the forward difference, right? fi plus 1 minus fi plus a truncation error of order h cube. Okay? So that gives us yi plus 1 equals yi plus h fi plus, of course, alpha square over 2 between limits of 0 and 1 will give you 1 half. So it's going to be h over 2 multiplied by fi plus 1 minus fi plus truncation error of order h cube local truncation error. Now we can combine these terms okay? and what you will get is equal to yi plus h over 2 times fi plus fi plus 1. And this is called the modified Euler method. Does anybody see a trouble in using this formula? If I want to predict yi plus 1. Remember, what we are trying to do in all this is develop an algorithm that we can apply repeatedly starting from some value. So this is the t-axis. Okay. So starting some, from some value, we want to predict what the value is at the next step and then repeat that. <coughs> okay. So if I know at i, I want to predict at i plus 1. If I know yi, I want to predict yi plus 1. Can I predict yi plus 1 with that formula? In a that <coughs> That's what I want every one of you to see. Okay? The problem with this formula is I need to calculate fi plus 1. But what is fi plus 1? It is f evaluated at yi plus 1. But yi plus 1 is what I'm trying to solve for. Right? So what do you do? Backwards is a very good idea to avoid that problem. So you already are seeing, if I take, for example, three term, it's going to involve y, y i plus 1, y i plus 2. The future is what I want to predict. I don't want what I have to predict to be on the right-hand side. Okay? You go for i minus 1, i minus 2, etc. to improve the accuracy. Instead of using Newton forward polynomial, you use Newton backward polynomial. Okay? And that leads to a whole class of... Uh, uh, multi-step methods and I don't think we'll have time to go into that in this uh, particular course but at least the basic idea we are exploring okay the question still is can I use this is this formula useful to me at all or not it turns out that it is extremely useful uh, in those problems that are called stiff differential equations okay? and we will see the idea of what are stiff differential equations later on and ODE 15s whenever you see a s in MATLAB functions, they are meant for step differential equations. They use algorithms like these. So this is called an implicit method. So the difference between an explicit method and an implicit method is an explicit method allows you to predict the future knowing only the current location explicitly, just a few multiplications. An implicit method says, I need to know the future also to be able to predict the future. So I'm coupling it. So yi plus 1 appears on the left-hand side and yi plus 1 appears implicitly on the right-hand side in this particular term. Does everybody see that? Okay. That function fi plus 1, the known function, but it depends on yi plus 1. yi plus 1 is what I'm trying to predict. Okay. So my question to you is what ideas can you use that we have developed in this course to predict that, to solve that problem? It, it, another way of looking at this modified Euler method is it is a better approximation of the slope. The previous case, that's also a good point. Okay, So if I have the solution like this, at i and i plus 1, this is y. Okay, So previous case, I said I'm going to take this slope and predict where it is. That is fi. Now I'm saying that's a poor approximation. I need to take this slope also at yi plus 1 
and take the average of the slopes. And that's a better way to predict what the future is. Okay? So this method has a built-in ability to seek information about the future and build it into the algorithm. And that's why it is able to handle stiff differential equations. Okay, let's talk about what are stiff differential equations. If I have, and we have already seen that in one of the assignments, intuitively, okay, the Lorentz equation. So if you have the time series y versus time, and the function does this, Van der Poel equation does this, uh, Lorentz equation does this. So this is the way the solution looks. And what it means is, if I discretize this with uniform step size, okay, I am here, and I'm predict to, trying to predict the next. So this idea of using the slope will work fine. But then I'm here, I'm trying to predict what the next step is this, and my slope points out there. So if I don't have the ability to see the future in the algorithm, that's what explicit methods are, they will fail miserably in problems like this, where there is a very sharp gradient changing the direction completely. Okay? And so you need to, to be able to see that in an explicit method, you need to take extremely small step sizes. Okay? But implicit methods don't have that, and we will show that analytically. So implicit methods have the ability to see the future, so they are better suited for such problems, where the equations are called stiff differential equations which show that kind of a behavior. Okay? My question to you is still this. I'm trying to extract the answer out of you. How do I solve that particular problem? When I have the future value that is on the right-hand side, what <laughs> problem does this remind you of? Any algorithm that you have seen, will, will it help you in solving that? Would F-Sol, for example, help you in solving that? You don't see that. Uh, am I going fast or am I <laughs> losing you already? I see a lot of uninterested faces. It's probably because we are at the end of the course. And uh, I can assure you, these ideas I will like, probe to see. There will be one question in the final exam where I will ask you to explain what is a step differential equation, what are explicit methods, what's a predictor character combination, which we are going to talk about next. Okay. But essentially what we have is we reduce the differential equation to a set of algebraic equations now. So you can treat this as an algebraic equation. You can write this as, for example, yi plus 1 minus yi minus h over 2 f of yi plus f of yi plus 1 equal to 0. Right? Oops, <laughs> it all disappeared. What happened? Okay. Okay. So in this equation, y i are known, h is known, but y i plus one is unknown. So just a nonlinear algebraic equation. So F sol can certainly do that. If you provided a guess for y i plus one, then say, okay, go and iterate on this. Another way of looking at this is you make a guess for y i plus one put the guess on the right hand side and it gives you a new value for yi plus 1. That is the idea that we have seen in fixed point iteration. Right? So you can tr treat this as a fixed point iteration where you put a guess on the right hand side. Whatever calculates is your new guess and then keep repeating that until yi plus 1 doesn't change. What this does is at every step, it forces you to solve a set of nonlinear algebraic equations using any method, Newton method or fixed point iteration or whatever. Okay? And uh, so the amount of work involved in using this method is high, but it has certain advantages. That advantage is its ability to see sharp changes in the future, which you will see in stiff differential equations. Now, in chemical reaction systems, we come across these stiff differential equations. I'll show you an example of an ozone decomposition problem where you have two reactions. One reaction is going very fast, the other reaction is going very slow. Okay? So whenever you have this time scale separation, one reaction going fast, the other one going slow, you end up with a behavior that looks like the stiff differential equation. Then you need implicit methods. So implicit methods are actually very useful, but they require more work because at every time step, you need to solve a set of algebraic equations. 
Question. That one is a stiff equation. Pardon me? That equation that you drew the sawtooth, that's a stiff That would be the response of a stiff differential equation. A response of a model, an ordinary differential equation model, where you're plotting y versus t. If it looks like that, that's an indication that you have a stiff differential equation. A very sharp change in the variable over an extremely small time range. So your h, the step size, must be much, much smaller than this fast response period. Okay, the fast, so th you can look at this as two peri time periods. One is a very slow response where it builds up, and then a fast response where it decays very fast, and then it builds up again. <coughs> a good example of this, I don't know how many of you have been to uh, Yellowstone. We were there a few years ago. Do you know the Old Faithful? Have you heard of this? You have to wait for 90 minutes or so, and then you see a big gusher. So what's happening is there is a process inside where the pressure keeps building up slowly. And once the pressure reaches a certain time, you see the gusher coming out. Lasts only for two minutes or three minutes. And then the process repeats itself. It has been repeating for years apparently. It's a beautiful scene to see. That would be an example of a stiff differential equation. Right? Any questions? Yeah? The one term expansion that we did before the two term expansion, that one was explicit. That is an explicit method. And that method will fail on problems like these. And we will see that in implementing it in MATLAB. Okay? So the lesson that you need to learn from this is when you, one thing, when you see description of what a particular algorithm is, they will throw these terms, implicit versus explicit, stiff, predictor, corrector. You should know what these are. And that's what we are trying to explore. Okay? Um, so explicit methods will fail in stiff differential equations, whereas implicit methods will not. And we have seen qualitatively why that is. And I will show you mathematically why that is as well pretty soon. Okay? Any other questions? Okay. <clears throat> we saw one term, two term. So the idea of a predictor character sequence, what is that? Okay. So here what you do is you pair an explicit scheme with an implicit scheme as a pair. So the algorithm itself will build that into it. So you will predict what the value will be using the explicit method. And using that as the initial guess, you will correct that using the uh, implicit algorithm a few times. So in our case, the Euler scheme, which is yi plus 1 equals yi plus hfi, with a truncation error of order h square will be a predictor because it's an explicit method. You can predict what y a plus 1 from that. So that will be a reasonably good approximation, we hope. But we don't want to take that as the final answer. So we use the modified Euler method as a corrector. And that algorithm is y i plus 1 equals y i plus h over 2 <coughs> fi plus fi plus 1, which has a truncation error of order h cube. So here, you take this predicted value and use it in here. <coughs> the first guess is going to be coming from the predictor that goes on the right hand side. And then you would iterate a few times. Okay? So you predict ya plus 1, and then you take this ya plus 1 and feed back into that. So three or four times you would iterate. That way you have a good initial guess to start with and then you are correcting it. And that combination turns out to be a very effective algorithm. Instead of making the guess blindly for YA plus 1 in the initial time, you combine this. It's a very simple idea. Okay? Predictor character is typically a paired up uh, set of equations, one from explicit and one from implicit. Okay, any questions? Okay, uh, now we are going to explore why it is that explicit methods have some problems and what are the advantages of the implicit method. Okay, so this is the concept of a stability.
a very important concept. Okay. What do we mean by a numerical scheme is stable or unstable? Let's explore the idea of stability. What do you understand? When I say I'm talking about a physical system, and you, you must have done this in physics. Uh, right idea. Anybody else want to give more narrow focus to it? Let's talk about the idea of a stability for physical systems, and then we will look at the numerical algorithm, stability of the numerical system. Okay. So <coughs> the departure from a, a stable state. What does it mean? Uh, let me draw a few curves and ask you to think about it. So this is kind of a parabolic dish. Okay. In that dish I have a sphere, a ball, a tennis ball. And then I take the parabolic dish and put it upside down. And I place the tennis ball there. And then I have a third situation where I have a flat surface and I keep the ball there. Okay. And initially I have placed them carefully so that they are balanced and they are not moving at all. It's perfectly balanced in this case so that they are not moving at all. Now I come and give it a slight kick or a blow. Blow air on it or something like that. So what would happen to this ball in the first case? It will fall back into its place, right? So it's going to oscillate a few times and then it will come back to its place. That is what we call a stable system. Stable system doesn't move away from the equilibrium position. There is an equilibrium position and it returns to the equilibrium position if you slightly perturb it. In this case what would happen if I perturb it slightly? It will never return to that. What might happen is if you have another well somewhere it may go and land in that well. So that would be an equilibrium position. A stable equilibrium position. So this would be an unstable this would be a stable equilibrium position. This would be a stable equilibrium position. What happens here if I kick it? Just stays there. It doesn't return to it. There is no mechanism for it to return to its original equilibrium position. In the sense, every position is a equilibrium position. So we call this as neutrally stable. So the concept of stability is if things are bounded and returned to its original state. Okay? Um, so you have a reactor, okay, a chemical reactor where you're producing ammonia or some chemical. Okay? And so you're feeding the concentrations and the reactor temperature is constant, the concentration, the conversion is constant, everything is working fine. That would be an example of a stable system. All of a sudden you have an explosion. We have all heard of plan explosions, right? What is that? That's an unstable chemical reaction. The heat of reaction is so high, you're not cooling it enough, and so the temperature goes higher, if the temperature goes higher, the reaction rate goes higher, more conversion occurs, produces more heat. Nuclear explosion. What is a nuclear explosion? It's a chain reaction. It's uncontrolled chain reaction. Okay? That would be an example of an unstable situation that just blows up. Okay? So physically you can try to relate what we mean by stability uh, and most of the systems that are captured by a dynamical equation of this type dy dt, let me just take a very simple example equals lambda y. So the function here is lambda times y. Lambda is called the eigenvalue. What is the solution to this particular differential equation? This is a model of more general nonlinear dynamical equations that we can see. Okay? So in this case, if the initial condition is y of 0 is equal to 1, and the function, is it a linear or a nonlinear function? Lambda is a constant. It's a linear equation. So what is the solution? y of t simply e to the power lambda t. <coughs> How do I know that is the solution? Well, I can take that and plug it back into that equation and see whether it satisfies it, right? So if you take the derivative of dy dt, what do you get? Lambda times e to the power lambda t. That's on the left-hand side. 
on the right hand side what do you have lambda times y but what is y e to the power lambda t okay so left hand side is equal to the right hand side so that equation satisfies the differential equation it is a solution okay so when would that solution be stable if lambda is negative if the real part of lambda is negative lambda can be complex okay so if the real part of lambda is negative then starting at 1 which is my initial condition that i see here the solution will decay like this if lambda is negative so the condition for stability is that i want lambda to be negative okay now i know that for this simple model i have an analytical result i know the analytical result has this behavior that it should decay to zero lambda is negative okay my question now is if I take my algorithms that I have developed and apply that algorithm on this model sequence, will it produce the same result, same qualitative behavior? It should. It should. Or we will explore that. In some cases it won't, some cases it will. Okay? And that's why it's an important idea to know when your numerical solution is not reproducing the expected result, even for a simple problem like this. If it doesn't work like this for this problem, then there's no hope that it will work for a more complicated problem. So that's what we are going to do next. We're going to take this model problem, apply it on Euler scheme, apply it on modified Euler scheme. Okay? Any questions so far? I know this is kind of a purely theoretical lecture, but there are very important concepts I want you to grasp. Okay? So apply this to the Euler scheme. Remember, the Euler scheme is yi plus 1 equals yi plus h times fi. Okay, but what is fi in our case? Lambda times yi. This is going to be equal to yi plus h times this fi is lambda times y, yi. Okay. I'm going to replace that by lambda times yi. <coughs> I picked a very simple linear problem for which I can do analysis. Okay? So that is going to be equal to 1 plus h lambda times yi. Or i going from 0, 1, etc. So the Euler scheme for this particular example becomes yi plus 1 equals 1 plus h lambda times yi. Okay? So let's develop the sequence a few times. For example, y1, would, what, what would y1 be? y0. y1 is 1 plus h lambda times y0. What would y2 be? 1 plus y1. But what is y1? can replace that and write it as 1 plus h lambda squared times y0 right so what would h3 y3 be 1 plus h lambda y2 which is equal to 1 plus exactly you are seeing it ahead y0 so in general what would y n be equal to For this particular problem, the Euler method will generate a sequence of numbers, y0, y1, y2, y3, according to that formula. If you know what the initial condition is, at any time step, you can directly plug n into that and predict the n value. <coughs> the question now is, we know how the actual solution behaves. Okay? y versus t, you give me the initial value and I predict all of them to be like this decay for a given h I pick h lambda is a given number in the problem lambda is a constant okay for you to think about is will this sequence of numbers mimic this behavior that I've indicated always for wh whatever choice of h I make Q 
first observation, very good observation. Because lambda is negative, I could get into a situation where the whole number here turns out to be negative. When would that happen? If h lambda is, for example, uh, 1.5. Lambda is some number that's given in the problem, and I pick my h such that the product of h times lambda turns out to be 1.5, minus 1.5 then the term in the entire bracket will be minus 0.5, right? So it's going to oscillate in size. One will be plus, one will be minus, one will be plus, one will be minus. So that is not really the actual behavior, okay? Suppose the product of h times lambda is minus 2.5. I pick h to be such a large number that the product turns out to be minus 2.5. Then what happens to this entire term? 1 plus h lambda negative 1.5. Then what happens to the sequence? It will still oscillate, but in addition to oscillating, it will go up with time, because it's greater than 1. We want this item to be less than 1. right? So you want the entire thing in the uh, highlighted in LO to be in magnitude less than 1, so that it will decay as n increases. If it is greater than 1, it is going to be unstable. It will blow up. That's why we say the numerical method is unstable <coughs> if your step size is so large that the product of h times lambda is uh, greater than 2. Okay? So the condition for stability in this particular case is h lambda, the magnitude of that, must be less than 2. If it is violated, the me method becomes unstable. Not only that, it must actually be less than 1 if you want monotonic behavior. But at least, if it is, for example, mi minus 1.5, h lambda is minus 1.5, then you will get a behavior that might look like this, but it will decay. Okay, so it will remain stable in the sense as t goes to infinity, it will go to zero. But if h lambda is greater than 2, this is going to blow up as time increases. Okay, so all explicit methods have a stability criterion like this, a stability limit like this. You must choose your h intelligently so that you meet the stability limit. And this stability limit has been computed for each one of the algorithms people have developed. Whenever somebody develops a new scheme, they will have to go through all these tests and see whether it is stable or unstable. If it is stable, unstable, what is the stability limit? Is there a stability limit for the step size? Am I making sense or not? Okay, so explicit method, the Euler method has a stability limit of h lambda less than 2 for it to reproduce a long time behavior that decays with time. Okay, now what happens to the implicit method? Let's apply this to modified Euler method. So we are simply uh, doing the simplest algorithms possible. These ideas have all been extended to more complicated algorithms like ODE 4.5. Okay. <coughs> the modified algorithm is yi plus 1 equals yi plus h over 2 fi plus fi plus 1. Now on this model problem, recall f is equal to h lambda. Okay. So we're going to replace that by yi plus h over 2 times lambda yi plus lambda yi plus 1. Because it's a linear problem, I can actually take this yi plus 1 to the left hand side and combine it. Okay? So then what I will get is yi plus 1 multiplied by 1 minus h lambda over 2 equals, on the right hand side I'm going to combine these two terms. It's going to be yi times 1 plus h lambda over 2. Once again, I'm relating the current value to the future value for the implicit method, but for this model problem, because the function is simple, I can actually algebraically solve it because it's linear. Okay? So it's going to be yi plus 1 is equal to 1 plus h lambda over 2 divided by 1 minus h lambda over 2 multiplied by yi. So what would be the solution in general? 
again you can go through the same pattern y1 will be equal to 1 plus h lambda over 2 divided by 1 minus h lambda over 2 y0 and y2 will be the same thing 1 plus h lambda over 2 divided by 1 minus h lambda over 2 square times y0 etc say that again I didn't hear you Uh, why not? Because we'll a Remember, lambda is negative. You are thinking in the right direction, but lambda is negative. We started with the problem, lambda is negative. So when you say lambda is negative, it's just going to be a negative constant that you give us in the problem? Yeah. Okay, and it'll okay. never be positive. Yeah, because that's the problem. F defines. In this case, F is lambda times Y, and lambda is negative. If lambda is positive, the real problem itself is unstable. Because earlier, Yeah, yeah. If lambda is positive, that solution will be completely different, right? The solution that I plotted here is for lambda negative. If lambda were positive, the solution will just blow up like this, right? So if the original system itself is unstable, the numerical method should also be unstable. The question is, when the original system is stable, is the numerical approximator of it, does it remain stable? That's what we're trying to answer. Okay, so pursuing your idea, so you said lambda, I mean, h lambda cannot be 2. It can be 2 because lambda is negative. So in the denominator, you always have 1 plus something, right? H cannot be negative. H is a step size that we pick, right? So from this sequence, can you say something about the stability of this scheme, the modified Euler scheme? What is the test that we need to apply? The, we need to apply this factor that appears here should be less than 1. Because that is the one that is raised to the power n continuously, right? If that number is less than 1, you are taking product of number less than 1, it's just going to go to 0. The number is greater than 1, it's going to blow up. So by implying that criterion, imposing that criterion, we found in the previous case, h lambda must be less than 2. But in this case, is there such a condition? If lambda is negative, the denominator is always going to be a number greater than the numerator. Right? Because why? You are taking 1, you are subtracting something from there, 1 minus something. In the denominator, it is 1 plus the same thing. So the denominator will always be larger than the numerator. Does everybody see that? And hence, this will always be less than 1. And that method is called an absolutely stable method. No matter what step size you pick, this method will remain stable. Of course, we need to choose the small step size for accuracy also. So there are two issues that one need to understand in integrating ordinary <coughs> differential equations of this type. One is stability, the other one is accuracy. Okay? Explicit methods have a stability bound. Implicit methods do not have a stability bound. So your choice of H in the implicit method is guided only by accuracy. <coughs> Whereas in the explicit method, you need to consider both accuracy and stability. Okay? So this method, uh, 1 plus h lambda over 2 divided by 1 minus h lambda over 2, the absolute value of this is always less than 1. So it's always absolutely stable. So this terminology or the idea of absolute stability says that it is independent of the choice of step size. Whatever step size you make, this scheme is going to give you bounded results. It's not going to explode, unlike the explicit method. And that's what makes the predictor character combination very, very good, because the predictor can give you a good guess, and the character will stabilize it and give you more accurate result, also more accurate result, because it has typically uh, lower truncation error. <clears throat> Any questions on that? Okay, so the next idea is the idea of a stiff differential equation. What do we mean by stiff differential equation? I've given you a qualitative expectation. If there are sharp changes, then you have a stiff differential equation. But can we quantify it? How do we define and quantify uh, a stiff differential equation?
Are we reaching the end of time? Here, people packing already. Okay. Uh, uh, let me just lay out the equation, and then we'll come back and analyze it maybe um, in the next class. Okay. Uh, an example of a stiff differential equation from mechanical engineering. This occurs in all differential equations, whether it is from chemical engineering, mechanical, or electrical. So the mechanical problem is one that we can understand. We can relate it to from everyday experience. You have a spring, and you have something called a dashboard, and that is attached to a wall. Okay? And to that, I'm attaching a mass M. And I'm monitoring this needle. So what I'm going to do is, a mass is attached to a spring and a dashboard. I'm going to push the mass and see what is the response of the position of that mass. So M is the mass, and C is the spring constant, and K is the constant for the dashboard. What is a typical example? A door. Okay. If you look at most of the doors that are spring loaded, when you open it, you want it to close automatically. So there's a spring that takes it back to it. Now the spring alone might cause it to bang very fast. So you want to slow it down. So there is a damper. And typically the damper is some sort of a piston with an oil in there, a viscous dissipation scheme. Okay? So that is an example that is captured by this. If you write the force balance equation, Newton's law of motion, you will have this following equation, m times d squared x dt squared plus k times dx dt plus cx is equal to zero. Question for you, what does the first term in that represent? Mass times acceleration, because it's the second derivative of position, right? So it is mass times acceleration is equal to some of the external forces on this mass. Okay, there are two external forces. One is coming from the spring, the other one is coming from the dashboard. The spring is this term. Because the force exerted by the spring is proportional to the stretching. X is the stretching, right? So the longer you stretch, the greater the force. And the spring constant is something characteristic of the strength of material of the spring. Okay? And so this is the spring, this is the acceleration, and this is the dashboard. Okay? And the response of this system turns out to be stiff. And I'm going to ask you to think of two examples. I have two such systems mounted on this wall, for example. I have one with a steel ball, other one with a styrofoam ball. Okay? And I'm going to come and pull each one by two centimeters and release it. What kind of response would you expect from each one? Intuitively, without knowing the mathematical background behind it. A spring and a dashboard system on the wall, and to that I attach, in one case I attach a steel ball, heavy, in the other case I attach a styrofoam ball, very, very light. to decay faster, exactly, so it will basically snap back its original position, whereas the steel ball, when it goes back to its original position, it's going to have a lot more mass, that means a lot more momentum, so it's going to overshoot that equilibrium position and actually compress the spring, and the, the spring will then push it back, right, so it will go to oscillate and then go back to its equilibrium position, whereas the styrofoam ball will snap back. And one is a fast response, the styrofoam ball. The other one is a slow response, slow decaying response. Okay? So there are two time constants in this problem. One associated with the fast process, the other one associated with the slow process. If you, you, you should know how to solve this. It's a constant coefficient ordinary <coughs> differential equation. There will be two eigenvalues. And it is a ratio of these eigenvalues that are called the stiffness ratio. If that ratio is very high, then the separation in time constant is very high. And most of these algorithms will have difficulty. We need to develop an, a, a, a special set of algorithms for handling such systems. Maybe with that, we will stop. We'll come back. There will be a quiz at the end of next lecture. I will continue with this and wrap up this topic. And then towards the end of next lecture, there will be a quiz. And uh, the last lecture will just be a review. Okay. <laughs>